most of us can expect to live 28,502 days. We'll spend 1,374 of those days reading books. We'll spend another 1,259 days online. And we'll spend 8,250 precious days holding our children. 1,000 days. That's roughly how long you'll live once you're diagnosed with ALS. Hi, my name's Pete. I was diagnosed on March 13, 2012. My husband, George, was officially diagnosed with ALS in the summer of 2003. Well, Hamilton Vance Paris is my stepfather. My father was also named Tom Kane. He got diagnosed with ALS in 2002. 2010, the summer of 2010. Passed away two years later, June 27th of uh, 2004. ALS is one of these diseases that for many people has a very insidious onset. I think it was the, the physical appearance was the most telling, first and foremost. You know, people can lose weight and still look healthy. There was something about his look that just didn't look healthy. He was moving around a little bit slower. Uh, certain tasks were just harder for him. Um, buttoning shirts, I think, was one of the first things. started feeling some twitching up in uh, my upper arms. OK, I'll drink an extra Gatorade eat an extra banana and I'll be okay. Our daughter was born in July of 2002. When she was about three months old, uh, my first really distinct memory of a symptom was coming home one evening and George told me he was changing her diaper and he told me he was having difficulty pulling the taps on her diaper. And we laugh about it now because, of course, my reaction, which was get back in there and change that diaper, it turned out that it was actually one of the opening salvos of a very serious problem. had an appointment with the doctor and and that's when uh, they told him. A neurologist had told him, you know, I, I'm pretty much 100% sure that you have ALS. You can look for a second opinion, but I don't think you need it. And he called me, you know, when he got home and, and, and told us what it was. Go home, prepare your will, uh, get your things in order and pretty much prepare to die. George came home and said he thinks it could be ALS, and we just thought he needed to see somebody who knew what they were talking about. A, B, C, D, E. Disbelief. Mm. And then he delivered the diagnosis of ALS. My life hasn't, hasn't been the same since that, that moment. It's not to be a 54-year-old guy watching his athletically gifted and graceful son wither away. That's not the way this is supposed to work. It was very tough on my parents that day, but for myself, I kind of just nodded my head and said, yep, okay, that's what we're dealing with, so let's strap it on and, and um, see how we can attack this thing. The best advice he gave was for George to go home and continue living his life. You have an illness, you're going to have to live with that illness until you're no longer living with that illness, but live. George took his advice um, to the fullest. P-Q-R-S-F-G. It was torture at first. It was small things, like not being able to put on a binder clip or button my shirt. But when I could no longer lift my arms or walk, the harsh reality that I was going to be a quadriplegic for the rest of my life set in. What I thought I knew was that this was an old person's disease. What I know now is that it affects a lot of young people, everyone, every lifestyle. And I guess I've been really um, taken back by how many healthy, athletic people this disease has attacks. George was uh, a phenomenal athlete his entire life. He was a standout athlete in high school and college, and he played professionally overseas for a while, um, continued playing. Anybody who would give him a, a basketball, he would be involved in the sport. Here's the number nine hitter in the order now, Peter Frades. Big, strong left-hander who hit home runs all over the college uh, campuses of the Big East, uh, ACC. And that is hit high and deep. That's a grand slam home run for Peter Freddy's. 
He even hit one at Fenway Park. And for a left-hander in a college baseball game, to hit it out of Fenway Park over 400 feet, that, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. So to see that left hand, which once had the power and grace uh, to play athletics at the top, and now not really be able to do much of anything. To feel this loss of control, this helplessness, this is what I think just sucks. My dad was, uh, you know, full of energy, full of life, uh, full of fun, little guy. Always had the big greeting, would like to joke around, kid around. This was a guy when he was younger, starting married life. He was in the Knights of Columbus and dressing up as, you know, Mae West and singing. He liked the spotlight. And he continued to do that even after he got diagnosed to some degree. You know, at the same time, though, he was a, a caretaker. My mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, probably 90 or 91. It was harder for my father because he was the, he was the caregiver that gets lost a lot of times with these diseases, you know, the, the toll on the caregivers. And then you throw his diagnosis on top of that, it was uh, just created a, you know, a havoc. For my dad, his, his main concern was always his wife, you know, like making sure she got taken care of. It, yeah, it was quite a couple of years. <laughs> Vance is uh, a true Southern man, through and through, Alabama born and bred. He became um, a father figure to me and just really was a great dad. He's my hero, to be perfectly honest. I was my mom's only child, um, and she raised me as a single mom for a good amount of time. And now she has Vance to support as well. Has to bathe him, clothe him. It's just like having an infant, but he's a 53-year-old big guy. I think this disease has um, brought out the best in my son in some ways. He's always been an inspiration and how he is handling this diagnosis makes me as proud a mother as I've ever been. It's kind of like the new normal and I'm getting comfortable with it and you know, kind of looking forward to, you know, a lot of these things that I've wanted to do and creating awareness for ALS is, you know, kind of my main focus. It's 2012, it's not 1939 when Lou Gehrig made his final speech there at Yankee Stadium. Uh, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of great things. Hopefully they know me well enough to know that I'm not going to take this thing lying down. A lot of people don't know that much about ALS because it's, it is a, considered an orphan disease. There isn't a, a, a great deal of the population at any time that is living with it because typically people are dying from it. Unfortunately these days it's about numbers. It doesn't get the attention that some of the other causes do. Eleni and I, whenever we see a wishing well, we always dig into my purse and we get a few coins and we throw them in. And when Eleni blows out her birthday candles, she always makes her wish. And Eleni and I look at each other and we've always made the same wish. Our biggest hope is that uh, an effective treatment for ALS will be found. Our dream is that a cure will be found for this disease. And our goal, I think, is that we can be part of that. And you know, that's why we're involved in Prize for Life. The, uh, the identification of a biomarker is just such a, a huge step in the progression to fighting this, that we have momentum now. And now's the time to really uh, take that momentum and build on it and, um, and, and end this thing. A thousand days aren't enough. With your help, the dream of a treatment can become a reality and give ALS patients more time. My dreams and plans are kind of uncertain right now in terms of how long I have to execute those plans or how I will be able to go about doing them. There's a lot of open-ended questions here. Let's find some answers. We're hoping, you know, real, real soon somebody really smart out there is going to figure something out to be able to slow this thing down exponentially or, most importantly, reversal for a cure. Down deep in my soul, I really do believe that it's coming. Finding a treatment for ALS would mean everything. Please donate to Prize for Life. The next ALS breakthrough could be yours.
and he uh, dry ice uh, there. Well, uh, you all hear me uh, in the back? Okay, give me a wave. Good. Um, so first of all, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Biogen IDEC, for hosting us today. This is um, a really great privilege to speak to you folks um, during ALS Awareness Month. But I um, just want to reference the video real quick. We uh, made that most in March, June, about a year ago. Uh, we were part of that for the Brights for Life Gala that we had last year. And those are some of the folks that are involved with Brights for Life. And uh, Cynthia and George, George, as you saw, a big, strong basketball player uh, who's now um, bedridden and uh, forced to live his life through a respirator and wheelchair. And um, I think you heard... Uh, Myself speak a little more clearly. Uh, maybe my face was a little fuller, but um, you know, it's over a year ago now that we made that uh, that video, and we're still out there every day trying to make um, some changes. So um, I figured I'd go into my story a little bit, and then. Um, you continue to speak about what you folks do every day. And I just want to make sure I thank you for doing what you do. Because not all of you may have someone directly affected with ALS in your life. But I admire the fact greatly that you go to work every day um, and work on something that may not affect you directly. I think that's tremendous and from uh, the bottom of my heart and my family's I can't thank you enough. So let's um, rewind here a few years back uh, playing baseball in the summer right down the street in Lexington. Um, I gotta brag a little bit that we're coming off our fourth straight league title I was 2010 MVP <laughs> in, in 400. My <laughs> bounty average of 400 was uh, All-Star MVP. And um, at one point I won the playoff MVP for that league. So that's not about me, but um, <laughs> moving on to 2011 where we won our fifth consecutive league title and uh, but yet I remember I was having a little difficulty at the plate where not as difficult as when I faced this young man in the front row back in 2006 but um, I remember I always got up work looking like this um, and my suit pulled up to the ballpark go right into my uniform and if we were at a away game I bet I always bet a lead off so literally within sometimes bet on the traffic um, you guys know through Cambridge uh, it can be brutal so I get there and literally walk in the batter's box and go ahead but um, I found that my 400 bag average was now in the 270s, which if you're in the big leagues, you can make a lot of money doing that, but not in the inner city league in Lexington. So I was wondering what's going on when towards the end of the year I went, I had a game where I went 0 for 4 with four broken bats, which for Kurt, it's very normal. He'd tell you he broke everyone's bat, but for me, that was very abnormal to even break one bat in a game. And I just kept thinking, man, something's off here. So fast forward to second last game of the year. Um, there's a kid from UMass throwing, and he's bringing about 90, and 
I mean, uh, he saw mostly fastball, so 90 was no big deal uh, for me at that time. But I remember I just couldn't catch up to the fastball, and I was really frustrated. I struck out, I ground out, and it was uh, since I was always one of the best players in the league, I could hear the other bench kind of taunting me and saying, yeah, we finally got him, look at him, you know, he is human. And I'm, uh, during the second to last inning, I got a check swing uh, fastball in, and as a left-hander, I check swung, and the ball rode in, hit me in the wrist, and I remember it's actually a friend of mine took a picture um, right at that moment when I was shaking my wrist. It's on Facebook. It's kind of wild to um, see that that's the moment in time where my life changed forever. Uh, because after that, uh, we ended up winning uh, the next game and celebrating, but. Um, I remember my wrist wasn't getting better, it hurt, it was weak, so um, I, as a traveling salesman, I used to try to, if I had appointments all day in Hartford, Connecticut, I'd try to leave my apartment in Southie by probably 6 a.m. to get there by 8, have appointments all day, get home. I remember I started to take naps on 84 West on the rest area. I'd be lucky if I got out of my apartment by 11 a.m. I couldn't button my shirt. Um, I was just super tired. My roommates thought, you know, this kid who works out so much gets up early to go to the gym. He's all of a sudden, we're, we're going to work at you know, their financial services, so they're nine to five, you know. As a salesman, I was in the office at seven. So when they started noticing that I was sleeping till 8.30, 9 o'clock, sometimes even 10, uh, they wonder what was going on. And frankly, I started wondering too, so. Uh, eventually went to the doctor, the wrist wasn't broken. Um, let's go to a hand specialist. He had nothing for me, sent me to a neurologist. He didn't have much, so he sent me to a neuromuscular uh, doctor at Beth Israel. And I remember going through these nerve tests. Uh, test is called an EMG and we did on the left arm first because that's what was affected and EMG consists for those of you who don't know uh, shocking uh, nerves with electricity to see um, if the path is open or closed and then the second part of the test is to use a small needle with a microphone on the end to listen to your muscle fibers. So they stick the needle in anywhere from your bicep, your calf, your thigh, the back of your neck. Uh, my favorite place, two places were right behind my ear and then right under my chin up to the tongue so they could hear what the muscles were doing. And I remember, I said, man, that is the worst test I'm ever going to go through. <laughs> and um, we did only on the left side first. And then the doc called and said, why don't you come back? We'll do a full body. And I remember him asking me specific questions about foot drop and buttoning my shirt and other questions that I thought, man, this had nothing to do with getting into my wrist. And so these tests went up for months and months. 
I remember in October of last year, um, I was uh, two years ago maybe now, I was sitting, my dad and I were watching a ball game of some sort, and I was on the iPad, and I remember I put into Google my symptoms, you know, bunny shirt, uh, uh, walking funny, or whatever the case was, and I stumbled upon the ALS Association's website. And so I clicked on symptom, and uh, there was about, I know, Lynn, I think there's probably a dozen listed there or so. And I remember I looked down the list, and probably ten of them were as if somebody had been watching me every day. Nailed it, dead on, these are what I have. So I had a mini freak out moment right there and thought, oh boy, you know, this could be serious. But I let the medical process take over and months later it turned out my suspicions were were confirmed and I had ALS and I remember when the doctor Dr. Seward Rucko over at Beth Israel, wonderful, wonderful man. He um, gave me and my folks the news. I remember I thought, you know, I kind of what I said in the video, okay? This is what I thought, no big deal. Let's get our work boots on and let's try to figure this thing out. But the hardest thing for me was not me getting the news, but being my parent, my now fiance Julie, my brother, my sister, having to tell them that you have a disease that currently has no cure and no effective treatment uh, was really, uh, you know, really shocked the mind and really was a tough thing to do because you feel like you're disappointing them by giving them this bad news and I remember we were at the St. Patty's Day party in Southie as I'm sure some of you know is a good time and <laughs> it was about a week after I was diagnosed and I remember I felt bad bumming all my friends out you know we're drinking beer hanging out and oh by the way this Lou Gehrig thing and I just remember seeing the emotion and the blood draw out of their face and and for as you saw in the video at one point it was a big strong guy and for this to take its toll like it is is um you know it's not the most fun in the world but um it's something we deal with and it's something that I know the man upstairs and uh, give me a plan. And it was really weird that when I was told, I knew that um, as a group benefit salesman, um, I wasn't living up to my full potential. I knew I, I could have been a better salesman. I could have, you know, been a, been a president of a company. I knew I could have done something great, but Whatever I was doing, it wasn't failing, it wasn't um, where I knew I needed to be. I knew that my gifts were not being used. And once I was diagnosed, it clicked. I said, this is it, this is my calling, this is what I've been put here to do. And ever since, this is what we've been up to, raising awareness and trying to let people know that Though only 30,000 people are currently living in the United States with ALS, our numbers would be astronomical if we had an effective treatment, if we had something to um, slow down to me, the effects of this disease. Um, if we can look at the facts, you know, you ask around your family and friends, I guarantee either someone you know 
or someone, one person away from you, either has been affected or has ALS. And the reason why we don't have the numbers of the HIV, the cancer, or MS is because we're not around long enough to make us think and to and let people know that, hey, we're here and we need uh, treatment and we need a cure. I told uh, George, who I met a few minutes before coming here, wonderful man that you guys get to work for. I'm so pleased I got to meet him. And I told him, I said, George, I'll be thrilled to wake up every day with Lou Gehrig's chronic illness. I told him, I said, you know, if uh, one day I'm walking around and, my, and I say to my wife or my friends, oh man, my LS is acting up again, hold on, let me take my pill. I'll be perfectly happy with that. <laughs> but until then, uh, right now it's pretty devastating to have a doctor tell you you have a disease just as serious as a Parkinson's or a cancer or an MS and for him to her to say. Okay, um, we're gonna go down to CVS, get one pill that has been um, a biotech that will give you maybe a month or two and then you're gonna go over to the vitamin shop and get uh, some zinc some creatine, some uh, vitamin D, um, and some copper, and a few other things you can buy over the shelf. And that's what you're going to take to try to treat this incurable disease. Talk about going to a gunfight with not even a knife, maybe with a plastic spork or something. <laughs> so. It uh, seems like ALS has the upper hand right now. But finally, long story short, what I wanted to get to today is to talk about you all and your organization. I was part of the tech study, and though a lot of you, uh, especially around here when you hear the word tech, I see a lot of heads going out, a lot of eyes looking around. But I was out of view of like that. I was so honored and pleased to be part of it and to know that there's people out there who don't even know me, don't know my family, don't know anyone they uh, work all day on something to try to help me. And though the data says this and the data says that, just knowing that there's a massive organization out there working diligently every day to come up with something to help me and others like me is so admirable and I thank you, thank you, thank you because I think it's so great. So from a patient who uh, is stricken with this illness, I wanted to make sure I was here today telling you that your work is not, um, it's not a regular nine to five, like my joker buddies who go to the, you know, the bank or the sales desk every day. This is serious work that you're doing that we truly appreciate, and we're so honored that you help us out. In any way, whether it, you're the chief scientist, or you're the marketing person, or you're someone who gets coffee, or you're someone who drives uh, someone uh, around. Whatever you do to help us, I truly thank you. And I'm so honored that you had us here today. And when they open and go too long. <laughs> great. Well, thank you again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, dear.